Welcome. Welcome back to everybody. I'm so glad you were able to join us for our second session of the Cambridge Biosafety Forum of 2023. Uh, we know that some people could join last week and not this week. We're going to be able to get the recordings up, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. But first of all, very glad you could join us. We have a lot to, I have a lot to be thankful for that uh, um, includes the many people who've made this possible. And I want to start off by uh, thanking my department and the Cambridge Health Alliance and the City of Cambridge for providing the resources to allow this biosafety program to develop into what it is. I want to thank Environmental Health and Engineering. They've been my primary partner in staging this, and there's a lot of work behind the scenes, uh, especially since we're doing it virtually. There's a great deal of help we needed. Safety Partners has always been helpful to us in our forums, and they're helping again this time. And I would like to thank them, New England Biosafety Association, Mass Environmental Health Association, Mass Health Officers Association. We're all uh, co-sponsors of this uh, session and the last one. And NEHA and MHOA and EPS are also offering CEUs. Uh, we, I'd like to thank all the many people who've served as community members here in Cambridge, and uh, uh, anybody who else who happens to serve in that role in another town. You're really doing the work for your community and it's really important. And to those who may consider joining the future IBC members who are community members, I'd like to thank you too. Our mock IBC includes Jessica, Diana, Miomi, Marissa, uh, Eddie, Patrick, and they're gonna be led by uh, Betsy Gilman, who's gonna moderate that IBC after the first uh, presentation is completed. Um, finally, I just want to thank Betsy. Betsy is the one who made much of this possible, and it's her experience in previous trainings and her ease, her organization and her ease of work uh, in getting things done that has made this really painless. So thanks very much. And I want to remind people who were not on last week or don't recall that all participants are going to be on mute. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A button, which will appear on the Zoom window. Uh, we'll take a limited number of questions as time allows. We're posing our own questions a little bit at the end, so we'll look for questions that we haven't already tried to answer. The session is being recorded, and the link will be available at a later date, hopefully next week, on the Cambridge Public Health Department website for both sessions, along with the slides themselves and information about CEUs, and uh, other materials that we've developed, which we can't offer because we're virtual. If you need these CEUs or CMs, uh, as I said, we will post that information. And uh, of course, it, when this site is available and when uh, we have a chance to communicate back out, we're going to prompt anybody who registered to become a community rep. And so you can look forward to that. So I'm here today because I have been working in the role of being the chair of the Cambridge Biosafety Committee and the director of environmental health for the city of Cambridge for about 25 years. And I've, uh, this has become a, a really important part of our work. And in that period of time, I've seen the enormous value in the program that, that has been put together and also seen a need in the general area around Massachusetts and greater Boston to share the experiences that I've had and some of the best practices that um, I've had and, and my colleague, Julian Farland over in Boston, who will join me in the Q&A as well. So this really all goes back to a, another time. Uh, I was actually an 11 year old kid in Cambridge at the time. Uh, and I have some memory of it because I was a geek, uh, but there were de big debates in the Cambridge City Council as uh, news about emerging scientific possibility of being able to move genes into other organisms and then have them be expressed or reproduced uh, inside those organisms became uh, a, a, a bit of a flashpoint in the biological research community. It became the source of a lot of amazing and intense work, but it also raised questions, uncertainties that even biologists at both Harvard and MIT uh, were not very comfortable with. And they felt that the overall picture of risk wasn't really being fully communicated to the public and that there needed to be better accountability. And so this in 1976 is the year when Cambridge City Council had a series of debates uh, that involved how we manage uncertainty around the risk of this emerging scientific work. 
Uh, that debate wasn't just in Cambridge, it was a national debate. It went on uh, through the media, it went on uh, within the federal government and even at the local level. Uh, and in the context back then, in the mid 70s, I think it's fair to say that there was a, a lot of disclosures about things the US military government had done, even academic institutions that had cast some doubt on the veracity or sort of the accountability of some of those institutions. There was a good deal being questioned about in institutions in general at that time. And so this, this, this debate emerged in that context and really raised questions about how much accountability to the public people in the scientific community have. So there were some really deep questions that weren't just about recombinant DNA risk. Uh, the scientific review of risk uh, was undertaken by the establishment through the NIH and through the National Academy of Sciences through a series of workshops that occurred in 1973 and 74 and 75. Once it became really clear that the functionality now existed to insert, transcribe genes into host organisms that could then be expressed. Uh, there are a number of leading concerns, and I list three of them here because they were discussed quite a bit at these conferences, especially a similar Silomar in Silomar II in 1975. Toxic gene products that might be produced intentionally or inadvertently, increased virulence and antibiotic resistance, a change of ecological host range, and uh, transfections to modify a host were all that could have a potential uh, negative impact were all proto-oncogenes, for instance, uh, one of the functional insertions that could in fact have a negative out outcome. In 1976, that same year, the NIH did the final work of promulgating their first uh, guidelines for research involving recombinant DNA nucleic acids. And that became in turn, after the city of Cambridge had imposed a moratorium during that late that same year became the basis for a city policy that became our first ordinance. And this uh, is where, and I'll briefly talk about, I'll refer back to the conferences and, and, and what was uh, discussed in those conferences, but then I'll really move ahead to the ordinance because I think that's more relevant. Um, in the 74 National Academy of Science Committee report, they discussed uh, placing a, a moratorium on certain kinds of experiments that are perceived to have higher risk or more uncertain outcomes, development of NIH guidelines that did in fact get developed. The Asilomar II conference operated from the notion that if the scientific community doesn't take active responsibility for the risks and characterizing those risks and managing them, that in fact, it may in fact be imposed upon them through legislation. And the outcomes were the reaffirmation of the need for guidelines, of course, and the establishment of a recombinant DNA advisory committee, the RAC, which currently was dissipated several years ago, but that function has been absorbed within the NIH. So again, in big picture here, and before I get into the specifics of our, of our ordinance in Cambridge, which are similar, I think, to many of the regulations that you'll find around Eastern Mass, um, are some basic concepts, some of which were discussed last week during Karen Byer's talk and during Marissa Cardwell's talk about the idea that we uh, look at the relative risk of an agent first. The risk group that a given biological agent falls into is the risk group. And that isn't the end of the story because as you heard last week, there are many factors that influence the final risk to work on that agent. So risk group is the starting point, but the final determination of biosafety containment level is takes into account the many other factors. These include the infectious dose of the agent, uh, how virulent it is, how serious the illness that could, could occur as a result of an infection, um, whether a gene transfer results in the production of toxins or the use of toxicants at any point in this uh, process. Environmental stability, if, the, if you do generate an organism or in, unintentionally release an organism that was pathogenic, how stable is it in the environment? Uh, aerosolizing procedures that are carried out during the research is that introduces a layer of potential exposure risk and a pathway. Um, the function of the gene product, we've talked about a little bit. There are some uh, intentional and perhaps unintentional, and I think people were very concerned about the unintentional outcomes 
back in the 1970s. Uh, the host range of pathogens is a, an important risk factor because if it doesn't affect humans, uh, it is thought of in a very different, uh, it's at a lower risk, obviously, from a public health point of view. The route and ease of transmission is an aerosol, contact, bloodborne only. Uh, these are all important factors. Vaccine availability, if there is a pathogen being worked on that um, could infect somebody, is there a vaccine or a treatment? Um, latency, how long does it take for symptoms to occur if it's, a, if it's a, an infection, a pathogen, because it could impact how likely they are to then transmit to others without knowing it? Is there a disease surveillance or a syndromic surveillance system that would pick up on something that became a community infection? And overall, the public health in infrastructure, how good is it, how well regulated, et cetera. So some of the benefits of this approach to trying to regulate through local regulation or ordinance. Um, and this is from my experience and from those of others who, that I've talked to is um, that it, it really increases a, a commitment and a focus on worker safety and overall risk awareness within the company that is complying. Uh, and this work is mostly done through the work of the Institutional Biosafety Committee, the IBC. We'll see a mock IBC meeting later tonight. Um, safe lab practices are a big benefit of that kind of careful review, good training that is reviewed and upgraded periodically, and then proper containment. These are all big benefits of uh, having this work be formalized. Companies also get more predictable oversight and they have a clear idea of what they need to do to apply, how to comply with the regulation, what documentation they have to produce. And they really do want to know how to properly comply. It's just good for everybody if they do. And then public credibility comes out of this process because you have community engagement and involvement in this process. It's really open to anybody. And that sends a really powerful signal to people who might have been uncertain or felt um, that, that this was opaque to them. This approach was also recognized by the Mass Biotech Council and they've even included it in their uh, initiatives to get communities ready for the biotech sector. So they actually give you, can give you, you can get a, a extra points in terms of your rating. Uh, I don't know if it's a gold or if it's a platinum, if you have a local regulation based on these NIH guidelines. So in fact, we've seen quite a few towns adopt them over the last 10 or 15 years in Massachusetts. Um, so the transparency we talked about a little bit and the accountability and the very fact that the public is part of this process makes it unusual, but also a very powerful uh, opportunity to create goodwill and credibility. Uh, there have been controversies, and they it's not always been without debate, even in Cambridge. But uh, the more recent contro controversies have tended to focus on the impact of the built environment around those labs, the noise pollution, the light pollution, and those kinds of factors. So it really has not been uh, driven by the fear of uncertainty. Um, so uh, I will say a little bit about how I've observed the risk, uh, the perception of risk in the community that I've worked with uh, change over time. And I think through the media at large in general, nationally, the work of the routine biotech work of most of the sector is, is largely accepted understood to be a very low impact. We were talking about BL1 and BL2 work. Most of that is not infectious work either. So it's really important to keep that in mind. If you're in a town or a community that's thinking about uh, inviting biotech companies to come in and you need to talk to the public about it, it's really important to make that distinction of whether any infectious work is happening. Uh, we did talk about the other non-risk, non-bio-risk related impacts and that includes noise and light pollution and parking problems. Certainly in Cambridge, that's been a big issue. Um, more recently, I've encountered, uh, and many others I think have too, that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. Uh, and people have picked, some of them are quite skillful and um, you know well produced. That has fueled a lot of anxiety among people who show up at local community meetings when based, very routine lab regulations are being discussed. Uh, with the idea that it's somehow more onerous or clandestine than in fact it is. Um, there are real public threats nationally and around the world about high-risk research and other work. Certainly, 
biological, chemical, radiological agents of terror. Uh, there's a lot of deep thinking and difficult reconsideration of uh, what work could result in biological weapons and whether or not dual use research of concern is something that we can try to monitor and limit. Uh, not so easy because many often the uh, basic research is conducted well before you know how it's going to be used, but it's a really important consideration. Um, the in emerging pandemics um, have raised a lot of questions about gain of function studies and whether or not they're worth risk, that uh, the benefit of the knowledge we get from them. And um, of course, BSL-3 and BSL-4 lab buildouts across the US, including in Boston, have been a real driver of public debate and concern. Uh, there has been a shift rather than from the research itself going on in the biotech sector towards the products that are coming out as a result of much of that work, including genetically modified food, the idea of patenting uh, seed stock, uh, genetically altered seed stock, which could become a monopoly in some cases. Uh, mRNA vaccines have been a debate and a boon, quite honestly. Um, and biopharmaceutical safety, efficacy, the FDA process of review have all been under some scrutiny and whether or not the costs then, uh, line up, the cost of medication lines up with uh, what people can pay and its benefit. And of course, gene therapy and CRISPR enabled bioengineering, including some early work that went on with the human uh, zygote that uh, in China that has been uh, prohibited elsewhere and since that time. Overall, I'd say that this process is a good example of pursuing accountability and a culture of accountability within the companies. Um, the IBC governance process is a compromise. It's rather than coming in and dictating exactly what has to happen precisely within a lab, which really would not work very well, uh, it's about establishing strong self-governance with transparency to the public. Uh, emphasis on biological risk assessment, and that's why we featured that last week during the session, and on discussion, open discussion among community members, that is the outside members on the IBC and the members who are in, internal members. Uh, the IBC authority under the NIH guidelines and even in our ordinance and in most regulations involves a lot of discretion. There are many decisions about PPE and what biosafety containment level to put certain things at. You know, sometimes you can have a, a, a precautionary approach. Um, there are a lot of judgments that get made, but the important part is the IBC meeting is meant to be documented in such a way that the, the rationale for making decisions is explained and discussed. And that's what should be reflected in those IBC minutes as well. Biotech tools and resources are changing a lot. The, the platforms that are used, the technologies, CRISPR being only one of many examples. And so there's a need to be flexible and continue to learn. And that's true for me. It's true for members who are community members sitting on an IBC and all the members on the IBC. There's a lot of nuance and perhaps a lot more involved uh, than with chem rad or other types of material hazards. Transparency, st strong safety culture contribute to public assurance. I said that I think a couple of times already. Uh, I've had so many interviews with media and community members where I get to describe the process and it really it resonates. Um, there are emerging challenges we've seen in Cambridge that may not be popping up in Boston or in some other towns, but I thought I'd telegraph them a little bit. You might see them coming. Um, this includes uh, laboratory incubator spaces where you have multiple small groups in one lab or science hotel where they provide certain services. Kind of a challenge to figure out what the oversight looks like there. A uh, complex lab ecosystem, I call it, where you have contract research organizations and you have quickly merging companies and high staff turnover. So it can be a challenge to regulate when there's that much change going on from year to year. The biotech sector uh, expanding into areas with less oversight uh, and transparency, they may be doing work on select agents, for instance, that wouldn't be covered by the NIH guidelines or those regulations. And then, of course, animal care and use is not a new or emerging issue, but it's adjacent to the work that we're discussing today. And we're going to hear a little bit after I'm done talking and, and answering questions uh, with Aaron Bryant Hall, who's our newly appointed commissioner of laboratory animals here in Cambridge. So developing biosafety regulations, I, this is sort of like lessons learned, I guess, from working with towns around Massachusetts and other parts of the country. 
And I think they're worth really considering, uh, even if you are in, still in the process of promulgating such a regulation. Um, will the regulation, will the, will the oversight include health regulations only, or are there going to be land use restrictions? Will uh, BSL-3, for instance, if it's being considered, be restricted by zoning or any other BSL? Uh, if the town has chosen to allow, say, BSL-1 and BSL-2, um, have they uh, determined what level of documentation and oversight they're going to need in order to show that those are reasonable levels of risk? Uh, municipal and county biosafety committees are a choice. They're not a requirement. Cambridge has an active monthly biosafety meeting. Many uh, town, Boston, and I believe Newton, and a number of other Somerville, Watertown, have gone through biosafety committees. But many uh, smaller towns with fewer biotech companies have may choose to uh, work directly with the Board of Health. Uh, I maybe even the Board of Aldermen may make a vote on whether or not to grant a permit. But Board of Health is generally where this is based. Uh, whether animal care and use will be part of that regulation as we're thinking about ahead of time. It's very unusual. Cambridge may be one of the couple of towns are thinking about restrictions on animal care and use now, but Cambridge uh, may be one of the only communities in the world that has a laboratory animal ordinance. Um, so there's also a couple of choices you can make about not choosing to permit BL1 because the risk is so very low and only permit BL2 or create a hybrid system where you have you treat different BSL levels differently. Uh, and as I said, Board of Health is really, the public health locally has been the anchor for this work for the most part in Massachusetts. And it really makes a good deal of sense um, for obvious reasons. So permit responsibilities uh, should are absolutely include and should include uh, complying with the NIH guidelines and any other document that's indicated in your regulation as, as uh, a referring document. Uh, we have our the NIH guidelines as the basis of our ordinance. But within our, our uh, pro procedures and practices, we also cite the uh, Biosafety and Microbiological and Biomedical Labs, the BMBL, and some additional local requirements in Cambridge. So compliance is with both those national guidance document and with any additional local compliance uh, requirements. Um, establish an IBC is a requirement, and it's also going to be in the regulation if you have one, no doubt. Appointing a biosafety officer within the IBC, within the company who's going to have the primary compliance role. They should feel some responsibility for uh, recruiting your community members and for putting, making sure the minutes meet the standard that the community is looking for. Uh, identifying generally two outside community members is the requirement, which comes over from the NIH guidelines. Uh, provide IBC members training if possible. Uh, that may be beyond the capacity, but that's one of the reasons we're doing this forum. Um, and um, determine whether or not you're going to require a medical surveillance um, contract or arrangement with each company. We do require that of every company. For higher risk work, that gets more detailed in the questions around what pro pro uh, pro post protocol, post exposure protocols, and other reporting, if there is a, a, a lab report infection, would need to be discussed. Reporting a potentially infectious exposures is a decision you may make as well. Is your, are you going to have any potential exposure, infectious exposure reportable with, and with a, what period of time, what format for reporting? Um, you could even um, choose not to and ask that it be doc documented in minutes, but that's a decision you should make. Um, the documentation is a critical part of this because we can't be in the lab most of the time. We do, I don't do unannounced inspections for the most part, unless I've gotten a complaint. Um, so IBC minutes are at the core of that, the quality of the minutes, whether they have included enough narrative summary to understand what the question or information posed was, how it was responded to, and what the discussion was for attribution. So they don't have to be transcripts, but that level of detail is what we are looking for, and I encourage other towns as well. So. Um, we require a presentation to the biosafety committee. Uh, many towns do. Uh, I don't know that they all do. Um, it could be done directly through meetings with the Board of Health, or if they do work with an outside consultant, there could be, uh, it could be done without a, a presentation to a committee or a health Board of Health. Um, so 
the presentations, if, you, if that becomes a requirement or it already is a requirement in your town, um, you can choose to determine what you want to have them present, but I'm gonna summarize what we require. Uh, the purpose of research overall, what's the overall mission of the company or the group that you're working with you know, scientifically, uh, overview of the procedures and technologic, technological platforms and methods that are being used, what vectors are being used, whether they're viral, bacterial, or abiotic, um, what agents, biological agents, and um, summary of those agents should include uh, what risk groups those agents belong to, whether they're replication competent or infectious, as it were, uh, or not, that's very important. The floor plans indicating the biosafety containment level if there are more than one in the lab, points of access, and um, we also require uh, them to indicate that they have a contract for medical surveillance provider, summary of safety practices uh, that usually go into a larger biosafety manual, which includes a training summary and lab policies uh, for especially specific to containment levels, maybe enhanced policies if you have an enhanced BL2 lab, um, permit compliance with the other permits, whether they're town permits or state permits, and basic service contracts, if they're all in place. The inspections, um, so you should determine whether or not your, your town has the capacity for inspections. Um, it is uh, not necessarily something that every town uh, feels that they have the training or the ability to do, and you may be able to work on uh, a consultant model for conducting those inspections, as long as you have a report back to the Board of Health and a good checklist to work with. Uh, general lab conditions, downing, hand wash stations, these are the signage. These are the first things I look at coming into a lab. 24 hour contact numbers, proper bio, use of biohazard symbol and indication of a biosafety containment level. I look for flow and storage of consumable supplies because that often impa impacts how much clutter uh, is going on in the lab overall and how well managed it is. It's a good tell. Uh, waste pathways for chem and bio waste, where's the storage, who's responsible for the waste streams and where they're stored and pick up. Uh, wastewater neutralization, if it's not managed uh, by the building itself. Uh, lab signage, we talked about a little bit. Uh, certification of air balance, if it's a BL2 or higher, is something we require. So it should be negative air into the perimeter of any BL2 laboratory space. Uh, and I look at overall ergonomics, a very high white noise level. I'll, I'll make a comment about that because it can impact worker safety over time and hearing. And then I reserve the end for governance where I talk about the IBC requirements, what kind of minutes we want, whether they've been kept in touch with their members and all of those good things. And we have come up with a program for uh, virtual inspection just for minor expansions on the same location. This saves a lot of wear and tear. We have 160 labs in Cambridge, and I can't always revisit every one every time, especially if it's a minor change. So I, I would offer that as a, an option. Wanted to talk very briefly, although I do need to finish up, about uh, the BSL-3 laboratory uh, uh, factors. They're, they're, they do introduce uh, much more likely to be live infectious work. These agents that are need to be contained to BSL-3 are a, often of great public health importance, and therefore they can uh, infect people if they're live agents, but many of them can also be acquired in the community. So it can be important to know uh, whether or not there have been community exposures as well. Um, there are a number of other factors here, but for the, in, for the sake of, of brevity, uh, I, you will get it's recording and you'll get these slides and I'm going to move on because uh, I think BSL-3 labs are, are really few and far between around here. And I wanted to summarize some of the lessons learned in the time I've been doing this work and in my many conversations with local people in local public health. They, it's staff capacity and level of training that is appropriate to that staff is really important consideration when thinking about your regulation. Uh, allowable BSLs is a BL1, BL2, BL3, Animal research requirements, uh, are they going to go into that regulation or are you going to be silent on that question? Um, science, life, labs, life sciences labs mostly use non infectious agents. I've mentioned that. That's very important in a community discussion if you have a lab proposed to come in and there are people who want to know about community risk. If they are doing live infectious work, it's quite manageable. Depends on 
you know, the, the containment level required, of course, as to what they need to do. Local biosafety regulations do reduce risk and they improve incentives for good practice. I've really seen this happen. And they do bring public trust and that's something you build over time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but these public biosafety committees um, are a good way to do it. And yet it might be more than you need if you're in a very small community. Um, it's important to remember that there are NIH guidelines, but they only govern labs that are receiving that federal money or money from other federal agencies. They generally all trigger those NIH guidelines. So private, privately funded labs uh, do not have to comply unless you have a local regulation. Uh, community members, obviously, trust and accountability goes along with their participation. Sometimes you have the Board of Health member uh, sit, and that can be much easier to manage, and you can get that person well-trained to do it. But there is a benefit of bringing people from the community into the meetings. And then the transparency, making those meetings, the minutes available to the Board of Health, uh, brings a lot of predictability and accountability, uh, predictability to the applicant and accountability and assurance to the community. And uh, very strongly uh, recommend that you do include community members if you have the ability to do that. So I have a couple of videos I, I won't be showing you, but when you get the slides or the recording, they're both fascinating short documentaries having to do with the early days of the development of these guidelines. And in the first one is really about the, the Kendall Square area and how that evolved over time. So I hope you enjoy them if you have a chance to look at them. And I will finish up with my contact information, although I think I'm pretty easy to find. And you'll get emails from us later on. So I'd like to invite Julian Farland to join me. And there he is. Julian is the uh, Director of Environmental Hazards for the Boston Public Health Commission. And he had, runs the second largest biosafety program in the state after ours. And uh, he works with a different mix of labs, but I want to thank Julian for joining us. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Sam. Um, it's uh, great to be with you and, uh, and thanks for having me. So we, we wrote our own questions to start off with, and we'll try to get through them efficiently and quickly uh, because you guys may have other questions. So um, I'd like to ask uh, myself and Julian, how much training would typically be needed for Board of Health staff to really properly review biosafety applications, uh, not as a member of the IBC, but as somebody sitting at the Board of Health having to decide who to grant a permit to? Um, so, my feeling, and you know, I talked about the kinds of documents. These are protocol summaries, uh, whether or not they're biosafety manual, their training summary is appropriate, their infection control plan, IBC minutes later on after they've been permitted, are they sufficient? Um, I feel it's very, very approachable, but it does require maybe a little bit of secondary training. Um, I know many towns have been doing this for years, so um, I don't think that that's really beyond the capacity of many towns, but Julian, I wonder what you think. Well, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's no real set, you know, in my mind, set amount of training, but, uh, you know, a lot of us and myself included uh, learned on the job. Uh, so, you know, when I was thinking, you know, my first instinct is, you know, you know, nobody who's coming at this, you know, whether they're uh, on a board of health or uh, any other uh, aspect should be discouraged. And my, my first recommendation would be to not, not, you know, not that, you know, I'm uh, just mimicking Sam, but to join as a community IBC member, seriously, because if you're a community IBC member, you'll get to review the IBC protocols, the manuals, and see how these things work. Um, and whether that's in Cambridge or any other town, um, and that will give you training. Um, and if you don't have that opportunity, just network with anybody on this call. I mean, I don't know everybody on this call, obviously, but I know a lot of names on this call and a lot of people on this call helped me as I was being developed you know, in biosafety. And I know that people are still doing that to people as they come up. So don't hesitate to ask. Uh, and so many people have things that they're willing to share their slides, their training materials um, as they go through. And I've talked to different Board of Health uh, people throughout uh, Massachusetts. Um, you know, when I worked in Grafton, uh, the Board of Health out in Grafton, um, I know they talked to other Board of Health, uh, you know, city Board of Health agents. Uh, so I know there's a lot of communication. Um, 
Yeah, so, I mean, I guess that's my, my short version is, is just reach out to other people. Uh, yeah, I've, I, I've found, like, I was in the same position as you. I came in as, my background was in chemistry and toxicology, and I had to learn this on the job. And it was only possible because of the community of people who share information in biosafety. And um, that it's a it's a really strong part of the culture, I think, among um, people in public health. Um, so I'm going to ask Julie in the next one. And if I can think of anything to add, I will. But can you describe how you were conducting inspections? Uh, let's let's say not not a BL three because then most people on the on the session probably don't have one of those. Uh, are they announced ever? Do you have certain times you don't announce? Uh, do you use a checklist? And what are you looking? Sure, for? sure. Um, and uh, I mean, first of all, uh, Simon Muchoi, who most of you know, uh, I mean, he's the director of biological safety now. He does most of the inspections, but I, I go on uh, quite a few of them with him. Um, and uh, I mean, our general format for all the inspections, whether it's BSL-2, BSL-3, or BSL-4, is we start with a document review. Uh, we review all the, the documents we have, uh, the latest protocols, uh, biosafety manuals, all, all the other manuals that we have, you know, in our records, uh, so that when we go on site, um, you know, we, we know what's, what the background is. And almost all of the inspections that we have are scheduled ahead of time. We do have the ability to do uh, unscheduled inspections, but those are in general, for BSL-2, those are only done if there's an accident or a injury or uh, an incident uh, related uh, inspection, in which we do do, uh, but for the most part, most part the BSL-2 are announced. Um, so uh, we'll go out, we'll do the lab inspection. Uh, and the first step for us is usually to meet with the people um, on site when we arrive. You know, we'll, we'll talk to the lab manager, scientists. You know, sometimes it will just be one or two people if it's a small biotech. If it's a larger uh, company, you know, they may send, you know, six or seven people to meet us. Uh, and then we'll sit down in a conference room, do a, you know, an opening meeting to, to talk about their research uh, and then do a walkthrough. And, and as everybody knows, sometimes a walkthrough with a small biotech is going to be one room. And sometimes, you know, for some of those larger uh, labs like uh, Vertex, it might be several floors. Um, and we look for similar things that the Sam described, um, you know, uh, waste, um, you know, ventilation, biosafety cabinets, um, microbiological techniques. Uh, we do like to, if possible, uh, have a scientist, uh, you know, uh, sit at a biosafety cabinet and do some pipetting. We just have them pipette media uh, just so we can see some work practices if possible. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's pretty standard. We, we have checklists that, that we do use. Um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, we usually have a, a short closing meeting, which sometimes can be, you know, you know, two or three minutes, and uh, and then we send a written report at the end. Um, and, and really, the only difference for the BSL three and BSL four inspections are that for BSL three and BSL four, uh, we do multiple inspections per year, and we always have multiple inspectors go, and we always have announced and unannounced inspections for BSL three and BSL four. Um, Right. Um, that's that's excellent. Thank you. And I think you and I overlap in a lot of ways. And I, I imagine that your checklist, maybe we even use the same one. There are a few out there um, in our resources that we will be posting on the Public Health Department website with the recordings of the sessions. We'll also have some uh, examples of checklists that we'll share. Um, so I'm going to ask myself the next one, unless, Julian, you want to ask me. Um, sure. Um, so, um, what improvements or quality checks do you recommend to institutions when evaluating IBC minutes? Uh, are there best practices for IBC minutes they should keep in mind? Excellent questions. Uh, so, I, the reason I, I, I wanted to talk about IBC, IBC minutes is that when I, you talk about the line of accountability and also, frankly, a good, the best indication of how thoughtful and well-organized a, a laboratory biosafety program is, a lot of that's really available through the minutes. And when the problems that I've had, the, the I, I say improvements, I push back uh, on minutes that don't meet the standard. When companies submit a minute, a set of minutes that are largely just the agenda, I've seen this, 
with maybe half a sentence saying we talked about X, we talked about Y. Uh, there's no indication of questions being asked or any discussion. That really falls well short of the mark. And um, so I guess the way I describe it, as I think I did during my session, was keep in mind uh, that we somebody reading the notes has to understand what the information presented was, basically, summary, but also a summary of the narrative, the discussion that took place, who asked what question, what was the response, what comment was made. That alone will really go very far, and that's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to ask Julian a question now. Um, what kinds of laboratory exposures and incidents are reportable uh, to the uh, health department? Is this specif specific in the local ranks or specified? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it is uh, specified in, in our laboratory regulations, um, and then we also have guidelines for our regulations. Um, so uh, basically, um, the institution uh, should call uh, Boston Public Health um, or email within 24 hours to report any accidental releases, spills, or accidents in labs. Um, and um, they um, also should report to uh, BPHC anything that should be reported to NIH uh, OVA. Um, and uh, they're required to report any illness um, uh, potentially caused by recombinant DNA material um, or um, high-risk agents or attenuated strains of high-risk agents. And there's a list on our website of high-risk agents, and those basically are diseases or uh, agents that uh, are reportable to mass uh, DPH. So, uh, you know, many of you are are aware that the state also requires reporting of, of diseases. Um, and so all the things that the state requires you to report, you also have to report to Boston Public Health Commission. Uh, and then we also throw in a couple of extras uh, just for a, you know, a good measure. Um, but, um, but basically, you know, what we ask for is all the common DNA exposures, all agents that you're permitted for, um, if you have an ac accident uh, or potential exposure, report to us. And what we really try to encourage when we go out um, and we talk to laboratories is even if you read the letter of our regulation and the letter of our regulation may say one thing, please report to us because it makes you look bad as an institution if you never report to us because we all know that there, there are incidents and accidents in every institution. And if you report to us, it doesn't do anything bad in the sense of we're not going to you know, make a red mark against your institution. We're not going to come out and punish you. We're not going to punish the person who did it. Um, but if you're on top of your incidents and accidents, uh, you know they're occurring, you're doing follow-up as an institution, uh, you're making sure that practices are getting better, it makes you look good as an institution. Um, and those are the sorts of things that we want to see um, as safety professionals. And um, it, because we all want the, the places to get better. Um, That's right. Yep. Um, and it's very similar in Cambridge. We don't have a separate ordinance in Cambridge. We have a provision that uh, in our, we, we have guidelines and procedures to follow that are not in the ordinance. We get more specific, but we, uh, a potentially infectious exposure is reportable within 30 days. Of course, if it's a state reportable illness that occurs, that is, a, that is obviously reportable right away. And if it, there's an infection thought to be the result of a lab exposure for any reason, of course. Um, but it's worth considering including that, what you want, what your reporting expectations are in the regulation, if you want to make sure people comply. Uh, I want to give our uh, laboratory animal commissioner time. So I'm just going to give a very quick answer to number five. It's There are uh, many ways to retain the kind of information you need to do proper review without it automatically becoming a public record. If that information would be considered a security risk, there are 14 different categories of exemption, but not just because you'd rather not share it. Um, so it is true that this information that's shared with the Board of Health or the body that is issuing the permit uh, could be subject to a public records request, but sensitive uh, information can be withheld. And there are categories that you can look at under chapter 66 of the Mass General Laws. 
So I now I'd like to invite uh, Aaron uh, Brian Hall to join us and to take over the screen. I'm going to stop share. Um, Aaron is a commissioner of laboratory animals for the city of Cambridge, and she's been here for less than a year, I think. Is that right? Um, yeah, but... um, actually, it's a year uh, in June, June 13th, I think. So okay. almost. <laughs> well, we'll have a party. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to let Aaron take over and take it away, Aaron. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sam, uh, for inviting me to speak today. So in the interest of time, um, I sort of came up with questions myself, uh, similar to how Sam and Julian did, but I formulated my slides to basically answer those questions. Um, and these are probably questions that may be common that all of you may have. So with that, um, I'll get started. So um, as Sam said, I'm the Commissioner of Laboratory Animals and similar to him, and as he alluded to, uh, this is a pretty rare uh, position within the country, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the first question that I really wanted to pose uh, to myself is, what are the existing regulations that are applicable to using animals in biomedical research? So there are two major federal regulations that we have in the US that governs animal research. Um, there are some differences in the types of species that they cover and how they apply. And so I've made this little grid to help me as I explain, and hopefully this will become a little bit clear as I go through it. Um, but there is the Animal Welfare Act and regulations, which is enforced by the USDA. Um, this is applicable to all research institutions that use the species that are covered. So even if you are a private institution, like a, a pharmaceutical organization, for example, and you have the species that are covered, then you have to comply with these regulations. Um, it covers all warm-blooded animals, except for mice and rats. Um, that would be mice of the genus Moss and rats of the genus Rattus, and birds bred for research. So you can see that uh, a lot of the animals that are mostly used for research in this country, which are mice and rats, are not actually covered by the Animal Welfare Act. And so, um, you know, other species like, like non-human primates and other things like that would be covered. Um, but unfortunately, that the major species are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. Now, that being said, there is another set of regulations that um, is, is typically put forth by the PH, PHS policy um, and the NIH. And, they have a guidance document that they both refer to that's known as the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. This document and the regulations are applicable to, um, to mice and rats, so of the gene genera that I mentioned. However, these are not applicable to any uh, research institution that does not receive federal funds. Um, they do not necessarily have to comply with um, these regulations for mice and rats and the other animals that are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. Um, however, um, a lot of there are some exceptions to this, and that is if the institution is ALAC international accredited. So ALAC is a voluntary organization that, that institutions can choose to have accreditation status with, that you apply to have site visits and to become accredited um, through this organization. It's a pretty reputable organization. It's a third party. They're not affiliated with any governments um, or anything like that, but they do use the, the PHS policy and the guide as uh, the guide specifically as their standards for review, especially in the United States. Um, like I said, they are international, so they, they do review European and Asian institutions um, as the most common, for example, as well. And then the other exception might be that journals that require journals uh, such as a higher caliber like science or nature, they have in their um, submission guidelines uh, for manuscript publication that they require institutions to comply with the guide if, they, if your institution wants to submit a manuscript to those journals. It's not necessarily restricted to those two that I mentioned, um, but some journals do have that requirement as well. So that would cover some of um, you know, the private institutions that may be smaller that may not be ALAC accredited um, and you know, wouldn't necessarily have, have private, um, sorry, federal funding that they would have to comply with the guide. Um, so you, as you can see, there is a little bit of a gap there for maybe some smaller biotechs that um, you know, may not maybe have self-funding, um, but don't have Animal Welfare Act uh, species. So then the next question that I've posed to myself is, what are the potential options for having local regulations that may govern animal use um, at a municipal level? So just to, to give you a background on Cambridge, 
the ordinance was passed in 1989. Um, it was it was basically passed because of pressure from this group called the Cambridge Committee for Responsible Research. And as far as I know, it is the first and only of its type in the country. Um, basically, it directs the CLA, that's the Commissioner of Laboratory Animals, that's me, to oversee the care and use of laboratory animals in the city. And I've just basically had a little expert excerpt here um, from the ordinance that you know, basically just explains that all experiments on animals shall be undertaken in conformity with all of the federal regulations. So um, you may see that this actually covers the gap that I mentioned um, in federal regulations. So this would apply and it would make the guide apply to all uh, animal youth that uses mice and rats and the species that are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act, um, but ordinarily wouldn't be covered by the PHS policy and the guide um, if they didn't have federal funding. So this, this covers that and does apply to all research um, institutions in the city that work with animals. So that's kind of nice. Um, there are additionally other local regulations that, um, you know, is, is they're uh, a little bit stricter in terms of, of what they have decided uh, animals can be used for. So for example, Everett decided to institute a complete ban on animal research and the city of Revere um, after the, the recent Suffolk Downs development plan uh, led to heated conversation around the use of laboratory animals. It resulted in banning lab animal use in completely in certain zoning district and disallowed the use of many species to be used in any of the Suffolk Downs development. So they did allow some animal use to be brought into that development, um, but it is restricted to certain species, um, mostly rodents. And uh, as I mentioned early, Cambridge remains the only type of the city with this type of regulation. Um, however, there are some in-between options that you know Sam sort of alluded to in his talk uh, that can be sort of a consulting model uh, where you have a veterinarian that you know you consult with to you know speak with a certain number of hours a week, for example. Um, you could have an eye cook requirement where you just require all institutions to have an eye cook. Uh, which is required by the guide for the care of animal use document that I mentioned earlier. And for those of you that don't know, the IACUC stands for the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. It is required for um, under that under the guide uh, that every institution have one. The Animal Welfare Act also requires this for covered species as well. Um, and basically, it's an organization within the institution that's made up of a veterinarian, sometimes a scientist, um, a community member, etc and they're responsible for reviewing all animal use protocols. Um, so that's one requirement that you could just enforce and make sure that everyone has an eye cook. Um, there are various options. And if you have any other questions, you're welcome to reach out to me um, for ideas and I'm happy to help. Um, you know, there, there is, you know, there can be a happy medium between what Cambridge has as a very hotbed of um, biomedical use, uh, as well as, you know, what other towns have done um, that very much restrict animal use um, and may restrict development and things in their in their towns as a result. Um, so with that, I just wanted to make sure that I leave this slide there so that you have um, my email address as well as the website for the public health department where you can find the links to the ordinance itself. Um, just a couple other things about uh, you know the, the CLA position and things like that if you have any additional questions, but I will also leave it open to questions now. So I'll turn it over to whoever uh, <laughs> would take it over now. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I'm back with you and Julian, I think will join us too. So we'll all be here. And Lee is our question line wrangler. Oh, I love that title, Question Wrangler. Hello, everyone. I am Lee Tatro from Safety Partners. Uh, I'm, I'm so thankful to be here among this esteemed uh, group here tonight, the, the superstars uh, of the show here. Uh, so we had a couple of questions come in from our audience. Uh, the couple of questions that I uh, have here go back to uh, Sam and Julian's portion. The first question is, uh, ha have there been any lab incidents in Boston and Cambridge involving biohazardous materials in BSL-1 and BSL-2 labs that have potentially put the community at risk? Hmm. Uh, I will answer to the best of my ability first and let Julian answer. Um, because of, it's really important to know that if it's a BSL-1 or BSL-2 uh, laboratory, it means that they are only allowed to do work which 
at most could pose a fairly modest risk of infection and wouldn't, and in any case, would not be a highly transmissible pathogen uh, with a serious impact. So this is why we created both risk groups and biosafety containment levels. And I would say, based on the structure of your question, no. Okay, great. Uh, and then the second question that came in was, uh, what biosafety level is a hospital lab? By and large, work in a clinical environment of that kind is going to be a BSL-2 by default. But because it does not, they're not doing recombinant work with recombinant or synthetic materials, they don't fall under our ordinance. And in fact, clinical spaces are generally regulated by states in most of the country in any case. But the true answer is that it would be default to a BSL-2. This is an understanding between the NIH, the CDC, and OSHA that anything where there's a bloodborne risk, uh, exposure bloodborne uh, risk, is going to be treated under BL-2 uh, standards and protocols. And uh, and just to add something, I mean that's something. If any uh, any people out there are uh, in the process of writing their own regulations for their town or city, uh, I mean that's one thing that uh, Boston uh, did include when when they wrote their uh, regulations is to exempt clinical laboratories because, as Sam says, clinical laboratories are biosafety level two because uh, most of them have human blood or other materials in them. Um, and those are regulated by other entities. Um, so we didn't want any confusion with coverage of our regulations, so we explicitly exempt them under our regulation. So if, for, again, your town or your city, when you're writing your regulation, you need to consider whether you want your town or, or city to be including those in your regs. Did you have something to add, Sam? Nope. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Julian and Sam, thank you on that. Uh, Great question, great information. Um, and then we have a couple of follow-ups that that have came come in uh, during that answer. Uh, so first, are BSL-1 labs subject to routine inspections? Uh, not for yes. Boston because they're not permitted. Uh, Boston doesn't permit them. One thing I will add though, is if a biotech comes to us and says that they're biosafety level one and they don't technically fall under our requirements to be permitted because they're not biosafety level two, we do lean on them. Uh, to ask them to get permitted because we say that in our experience, most biotechs uh, that are brand new do end up uh, doing level two uh, research at some point in their lives. So we encourage them to get uh, permitted with us. I mean, we don't force them to, we just you know kind of tell them what our knowledge is of the history of development of a biotech. Sorry, Sam. Oh, no problem. We, are, we do treat BSL-1 uh, as fully permitted laboratories. So they are required to get inspections um, there are similar requests to be exempt based on the certain organisms in the NIH guidelines that would be considered exempt. By and large, if it's a recombinant organism, even if it's considered exempt in the NIH guidelines, we call it BL1. So we basically err towards BL1 in that case. Right. And then how many communities in Massachusetts have regulations that are similar to Cambridge? I have tried to find out. Uh, I've done a little work to try to get people recruited for this training. I think we're approaching 20 to 22 communities in Massachusetts that currently have some form of regulation. Wow. That's more than I, more than I thought. That's a good amount. Um, and they may be most of those that exist in the country, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the last question before we uh, go into our Next part of, of tonight's uh, tonight's session. Uh, would you recommend IBCs receive copies of reports from inspections? Uh, I think it would be valuable, if not a, a straight re full report, that if there's any commentary, obviously any any uh, any violation or something which is inadvisable that that some summary be submitted. I think that makes a lot of sense. The technical chest checklist inspections aren't of very great value. Some integrated observation, I think that would be very valuable. Yeah. 
Thanks, Sam. Uh, we're just about to go into our mock IBC in our next uh, next part of tonight's session. Um, quick reminder for everyone, if you do have questions during that session, please put in the Q&A section. Uh, we did have a question from the audience as well, as far as uh, Aaron's contact info uh, to be put up again. Uh, I guess it also leads to the question of availability of the deck or this information after uh, the session. So uh, could you speak to that, Sam? Yes, I will. Um, we I'm negotiating with our my own colleagues in the public health department about their uh, ability to put up that information. And I think we're looking at the second half of next week to get um, updated event page, which will have links to the recorded sessions, the slides, supporting material, and of course our contact information. But we'll, we're gonna push out an email to everybody who registered to let you know when that's available. Wonderful, thank you, Sam. And with that, we're uh, back on time, back to you. All right. Thanks, Lee. I'm Betsy Gilman Duane, and I'm pleased to introduce the final presentation for our Cambridge Biosafety Forum tonight. Um, first, thanks to Jessica Healy. Jessica is a principal consultant with environmental health and engineering, and she organized our mock IBC and recruited our members. So thank you very much, Jessica. Um, as Sam mentioned, IBCs are a crucial part of a robust biosafety program and ensure the transparency between the organization and the community. Um, so we're very happy tonight to have a mock IBC to illustrate and show you some of the best practices and some of the, the discussions that um, can take place in an IBC. And a colleague of mine once said that when you've seen one IBC, you've seen one IBC because each one is very unique and different. And um, hopefully as time goes on, the sharing of best practices will allow all IBCs to continue to improve. Um, as a reminder, we will do questions at the end, um, shortly before um, eight o'clock or when the mock IBC meeting wraps up. So please put your questions that you have in the Q&A and Lee will kindly um, rejoin us uh, towards the end to um, pose any questions um, to the IBC members. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and um, as part of the uh, first agenda item, which I will pull up shortly, um, they will do a welcome and introductions and you will get to meet the mock IBC members. Um, so thank you, Jessica and mock IBC members. We really appreciate your efforts tonight. Thank you for the introduction, Betsy. So as Betsy mentioned, I'm Jessica Healy. Um, I've been working at EHE for whew, almost 15 years now. And I mostly work in research safety with a focus on biosafety. And tonight for the mock IBC, I will be chairing the mock IBC. Um, if we can just, uh, let me see if I can, if we can just go through uh, and introduce ourselves with, uh, introduction of the role you're playing tonight, as well as what your day job is. Um, I'm just going to go down based on the order that I'm seeing you in. So, Eddie, you're up. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Eddie Hall, and I am the biosafety officer and PHS manager at Beam Therapeutics, and I'll be playing the role of community representative today, or one of them at least. Okay, and Diana? Hello, my name is Diana Lukatun. I am a staff scientist at Environmental Health and Engineering, and I will be playing the biosafety officer. Okay, and Marissa? Hi, I'm Marissa Cardwell, Director of Biosafety and Radiation Safety at Harvard University, and tonight I'm a, a committee member and a subject matter expert. All right, Patrick. Hello, Patrick here. I am in Brigham Research Space and Operations, and tonight I am a community member. Thank you. And Miami. Hi, my name is Miami. I work for H&E, and today I will just be like a scientific member on animal research matters. Great. Thank you for that introduction, everyone. Uh, moving on to our meeting proper, the first thing that we need to do is review and approve the minutes from our last meeting. 
And since we are very small and we don't have a lot of new research, our last meeting was last year. So did everybody get a chance to look at the minutes? Um, yes. Great. Did anybody have any questions about the minutes? And I think there's another page of those minutes if we, uh, there we go. I'll put, uh, my vacation was very nice. <laughs> Glad to hear Last it. Last year. <laughs> All right. So do we have a motion to approve the minutes? A motion. Go ahead. Motion. <laughs> okay. So lots of motions. Patrick, <laughs> would you like to motion? And then I'll, I'll motion to approve the minutes, please. I'll second. Great. All in favor, raise your hands. Minutes are approved. Okay, moving on to um, the biosafety officer's report. Diana is going to let us know how things are going in the biosafety lab safety realm. Uh, so we have completed all the laboratory inspections for this quarter, so we did not find anything that was very concerning. Um, we did have some reports of some um, close call uh, accidents, but we did get uh, the report when it happened, and we submitted the, the information to the PI and to occupational health, so everything seems, seems to be in order. Uh, apart from that, you know, and same as, same as always, so nothing too interesting. So no actual injuries, just near misses? No, no, it was just near misses, yes. Okay, glad that they reported that. Um, it can be tricky to get people to self-report when no one got hurt sometimes, but it definitely helps us. Yes, I mean, we just try to tell everybody that, you know, you it's, an, it's called an accident for a reason. So, you know, you're not gonna get in trouble. Just make sure that you let us know. Great. Okay, so Diana is going to briefly present a training for the members, uh, some extra biosafety knowledge about viral vectors today. So if we can get those slides up, that would be great. Thank you so much. Okay, you're just gonna have to forgive me. I've been, my allergies are bothering me, so. <laughs> but, um, so I'm gonna do a very, you know, a quick presentation on antiviral vectors and biosafety. Um, so that's the presenters that you can see. Uh, next, please. Okay, so uh, lentiviral vector, it's a genetically modified virus. I mean, so um, all of us have done research, so we have seen uh, that vectors is one big major part of our, of our research. Um, Part of the virus genome is removed and replaced with genes of interest. So uh, the removed material includes genes that are responsible for replication and there's a virulence. So you can see, uh, you can have uh, somebody using like a rabies vector, but they take out the virulence so it's attenuated. So you will not see, um, in theory, you should not see it um, replicate. Uh, replication de defective virus is one that has been modified so it can replicate, it can't replicate inside the cell and thus it cannot cause infection. Um, when the modified virus infects a target cell, it inserts a genome interest into the cell's genome. So, I mean, it's just plasmid work, you know. Um, next, please. So uh, we use viral vectors in research as assessed for gene overexpression or expression, gene silencing or reporting, tracing. So you can actually use uh, transfer a foreign gene into a cell organism, and then you can cause the overexpression of a, a gene of interest. Uh, so this is used very commonly just so you can study like a gene function, um, make you can figure out what what's the what's the bio work of that gene. Um, you also do it the same thing with silencing. Um, they do that a lot with. Um, oncogenic research where you silence a gene and then try to see the effects of that. Uh, reporting and tracing, that's 
um, I've seen that a lot in cancer research too, that you actually tag you know, the, the, the protein with a fluorescent, and then you can use lasers to kind of excite that and you can see the pathway of, of that protein. So um, next please. The most common backbone is HIV-1, uh, that's your lentil viral, and uh, it's often pseudotyped to alter tropism. Uh, VSVG is the most common pseudotyping protein. Uh, to increase safety, lentiviral vectors are genetically modified, so you actually silence the, the, the gene that will cause pathogenesis. Uh, split genes are required for viral replication. Uh, fully partially delete some genes involved in replication pathogenesis, so that way you do not have you know, uh, uh, the gene actually <laughs> becoming a problem. Uh, in second generation vectors, genes are split into three plasmids. Third generation vectors are split into four plasmids. Most of the plasmids that are used now are third generations because it's safer and you actually um, are able to prevent recombination a little bit better because you have three, four different plasmids and each plasmid has uh, uh, like the TAT removed, you know, the LTR that's, that's partially deleted. Uh, next, please. And here you can see the, the way that the lentiviral vector works. You have the chimeric, then you have the promoter, um, the cDNA, or you have the, the um, hair loop RNA, and then you have LTR. Okay, next please. Okay, so the advantages, you know, you can carry moderately sized transgenes. Uh, you can infect both dividing and non-dividing cells. It's efficient for gene transfer. It's used very often, so you know this. Im no immunogenic proteins are generated. Uh, you have a stable transgene expression, and it's susceptible to most disinfectants, which is something that you want uh, in case you have uh, contamination, and it's not able to survive well outside the laboratory. That's not to say that it cannot happen. So we have had... Um, uh, laboratory acquired illnesses that have happened if you're not careful. Uh, disadvantages, oncogenic materials, as I said, uh, accidental infection with a harmful gene, and you have a small potential for generation of a replication. So, next, please. Okay, so that's just a picture of a lab, so you can kind of see. <laughs> next, please. Okay, so uh, whenever you're working in a lab, you have the first thing you do is a risk assessment, especially uh, taking into account the SOP that you will be doing. Uh, so this one, your hazard, of course, is a material that and procedure can cause harm to people's animals or the environment. Agent hazard is pathogens, oncogenes, and toxins. So that's one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're when you're working with uh, organism you, or you have to or a gene, you have to know what your risks are when you're working with it. Uh, laboratory procedure hazards, you know, sharp use, you can actually self-inoculate if you're not careful. Uh, handling large volumes of infection materials, the more you handle, the more likely you are, you're, you assume a higher risk when you um, scale up. And equipment may generate aerosols. So that's your, your vortexes, your centrifuge, you know, flow cytometer, et cetera. Uh, and the risk is the likelihood that a hazard will cause harm. So all of these are mitigated with proper containment. Next, please. So in your risk assessments, what you wanna do is identify the hazards for the procedure. So your SOP, what you're, what you're doing, identify ways that exposures or injuries can occur and determine the associated consequences of an exposure or injury. This is a way of trying to figure out uh, what, how you're gonna, how you're gonna respond when you have an exposure or an injury happening. Uh, and this is a good way for, especially if you have people that are new to a lab, that they keep this in mind when they're doing their work. Uh, the risk assessment is also used to determine containment levels, microbiological practices, uh, the safety equipment that you'll use and what safeguards you will be using. Next, please. So this are the is, this table is the uh, hazard associated with viral vectors. So you know your viral design. You can have um, generation of 
replication competent virus. Um, you can have for the transgene existential exposure to oncogenes, toxic toxin genes. Uh, the scale, the larger the scale, the higher risk of exposure. Sharp self inoculation. So uh, I think everybody that has worked with needles has had that experience at some point. Uh, laboratory equipment, you have aerosol, aerosolization or spills. And animal experiments as viral shedding, sharps use. That's yeah. when you have, when you do research with animals, that's a question that comes up that they will ask you how long or how will you have shedding from whatever you're inoculating the, the mouse or rat with. And that's the reason because some of those, some things will actually come up either in the feces or things like that. Not all the time, but sometimes it does happen. Um, so for the animal experiments, you can do it BSL-2 housing so that you increase the, the, um, the safety for, for uh, handling those animals. Uh, for laboratory equipment, you know, you can do the equipment design, uh, work in the biosafety cabinet, so we can pick up any aerosols. Um, I know some devices that will use like a bio bubble, and that helps to prevent um, any aerosols. Uh, for sharps use, there's there's uh, self there's some needles that you don't have to recap, even though technically you're not supposed to recap needles anyways, but uh, but there's some that they the moment you get done with them, they they um, they kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, go in, so that way you're not you're not gonna get yourself like um, hooked or something. Uh, for the scale, of course, you know when you work with a larger scale, uh, the your spill could be bigger, you know, and so that of course um, that's part of the risk that you that you take by scaling up. Uh, for a transgene, you know, restrict sharps use, work in the biosafety cabinet, use the proper PPE. Um, next, please. Okay, so um, so the risk of wild type regeneration. So that's the when you're doing when you're making a vector, you don't want it to go to wild type because that's when you know it can cause illness. So uh, replication deficient viral vectors can recover the deleted genes required for replication through recombination, enabling them to make wild type virus, which is the one that can cause the illness. Uh, the risk of recombination is lower when you, uh, with vector systems that have the vector and packaging function separated, so that's your third generation antiviral, uh, onto three or more plasmids to minimize recombination events. Next, please. And so this is your the nature genome interest transgene. And so the risk of exposure to a transgene, you can see it. The higher risk is human oncogenes. Your lower risk is your marker proteins. So you can see antagonists, tumor suppressors, uh, genes coding for toxins, uh, your uh, small interferon RNA, your loop RNA, human genes not associated with disease, and uh, four mammalian genes not associated with disease. Next, please. So uh, you can have uh, mutagenesis that can happen sometimes. Uh, that's one thing that you're trying to make sure um, to keep in mind when you're working with antiviral vectors. Um, it can be an intervention side effect of virus mediated stable transfection has caused leukemia in at least one clinical trial. And it's associated primarily with rich for viral and antiviral vectors. Um, through AAV vectors, you can have similar risks. Next, please. Most viral vector work is done at BSL-2. Um, so that includes all BSL-1 practices, lab specific training, supervision, uh, restricted access to the labs. Um, some of the labs you also do like the airflow, you know, you make a negative to the hallway. Uh, physical containment, you work in the biosafety cabinet, work from the clean to a dirty side. Uh, make sure that when you're working with a cabinet, you do clean under the tray. Uh, once in a while, I've gone to labs where it's been months that <laughs> they've cleaned under the tray and then they get contamination. Ensure all work surfaces are decontaminated with the proper disinfectant. So this is the disinfectant that will uh, kill off what you're working with. Some, you know, not because it just it says disinfectant, it will kill everything and uh, have biological waste disposal procedures. Next, please. And so here's a hier hierarchy of controls. Uh, 
a lot of people think that PPE is your first one. No, it's not. <laughs> That's your last one. Um, first, you try and see uh, if you can reduce the hazard. So that's your first one that you can see. Um, I know it happens a lot in chemistry. So if you want to use one chemical, or can you use something that's safer? Um, that's the substitution to reduce your hazard. Engineering, so move the hazard away. So that's um, that's kind of like your, um, if you have like door controls, um, interlocks, things like that, that's your engineering in there. I'm sure that's your SOP. This is why it's very important that when you write your SOP, you follow your SOP. Um, and that way you can, because when you write it, when you write a proper SOP, you are writing there the risks that will come up and how you're going to deal with those risks. And when you kind of deviate from that, then that's when we can have an issue. And uh, PP, so you place barrier between you and the hazard. Um, that's, you know, coats, gloves, um, other PPE, uh, if you're working with aerosols, make sure you're changing your gloves um, often, um, things like that when you're coming in and out of a safety cabinet, you know, spraying with ethanol, et cetera. Next one, please. Uh, so there you have your engineering controls uh, as your biosafety cabinet and, uh, you know, proper work area setup, reduce clutter. Don't block the grills. That one I have seen very often, especially if you're working and you're working off of a notebook. I've seen people put it on the grills. And then of course you're defeating the whole purpose of your biosafety cabinet. Uh, disinfect before and after work. Don't depend on somebody else that they clean the cabinet and then you're going into work. You don't know if they cleaned it properly, especially if you're doing cell culture work. Um, and always wear PPE and make sure that even though you're wearing PPE that you're that you're using it appropriately. Uh, the centrifuge safety, seal buckets, you know, the rotors, they have the caps that you can close them. Uh, make sure that your centrifuges are balanced so that way you don't have any uh, breaking of, uh, of um, centrifuges. And then um, sharp safety, you know, use the sharp, the sharps box. It has a line where you cannot go over. Please don't go over it. Um, then use safe needle systems. Next one, please. And so your administrative control, so you just by safety committee approval, that's your IBC, your written procedures, SOPs, just follow those by safety training so you know what your risks are. Uh, good microbiological technique, if you have good accepted technique, you know, uh, it does help minimize any exposures. Restricted access, you do not want uh, the general public being able to get into your space. Uh, effectively decontaminate. Um, the area you're going to work with, a spill response plan. So know what you're going to do according to what you're working with. Um, proper waste disposal, lab hygiene, so hand washing. Uh, that's the one that I have seen happen where people take off gloves and don't wash their hands and they just leave. Um, a lot of people think that you're not, you don't get stuff on you, but you actually can get stuff on you more often than you think. Uh, aerosol minimization, that's also if you're pipetting, you're trying to make sure that you're not creating aerosols. Uh, signage and labeling and medical surveillance, so that could be your occupational health, uh, getting your vaccinations, like your HEPI, et cetera, depending on what you're working with. Uh, next, please. And uh, your per personal protective equipment, lab coats. Uh, Disposable versus non-disposable, that's according to what you're working with. That will be at the discretion of uh, the PI and according to your SOP. I am face protection. Make sure that you use those if you're using if you're working with liquids. And safety glasses with, with side shields. Face protection, you know, goggles, face shields, um, especially if you have something that can splash on you. Gloves, make sure that you're wearing the appropriate gloves for what you're working with. Uh, disposable nitrile latex. I know a lot of people have latex um, allergies, so nitrile is, is the one that I like using better. Uh, surgical masks and um, N95 respirators, those you have to get fit tested, so you cannot just go and buy a respirator and put it on. It has to be fit, fit tested to make sure that it's actually going to work. Next one, please. Uh, so in vivo experiments, you have to consider, are you generating a uh, stable to induced cell line to inject into your animals? Um, will the animals get the viral vector? How will the animals be safely restrained and sedated, especially when you're working with, you know, you can get bites or you can get uh, a mouse or rat running out of your bite safety cabinet. Uh, what will be excreted and how long? And where should this work be performed? So all of those 
And those should be also part of your SOP. Next one, please. Safety considerations, so proper hand, sharps handling, you know, just make sure that you're putting in the sharps container. Um, don't leave sharps in your benches or in your biosafety cabinets unattended. Uh, appropriate restraint techniques um, or sedation of the any animal you're working with to prevent bite, bites or scratches. Uh, properly identify your hazards associated with cage changing, any animal care. Uh, pros the appropriate door signage and waste disposal, how you get rid of your bedding and any carcasses of, of animals. I know for um, some of the requirements, you actually have to do cradle to grave so when you begin till you end. So next one, please. Uh, so spill response. So you know you have your two difference and non-emergency or emergency. Uh, for the non-emergency, you know what the hazards are associated. Inhalation is not a concern. Um, the spill does not generate a hazards by product and you have the supplies to deal with it. Uh, even if you know that you it's not an emergency, but you don't have the appropriate supplies, you can always call somebody to, to help. Uh, for emergency, you don't know what the hazards are. You don't have the supplies. Uh, there's a personal exposure. So now that comes into like OHP. Uh, the spill is in a public space, a sterile elevator, and you're not sure what to do. Tell somebody and don't just, don't just walk away. We had one time, uh, a person that uh, broke a bottle of chloroform at night and decided I'm just gonna go home and <laughs> left it. So that was interesting. Next one, please. Uh, for non-emergencies, wait 15 minutes for aerosols to settle. Uh, wear personal equipment, PPE, so like your lab coat, your gloves, according to what you're working with. Place absorbent material in this pill area so you can do the socks that you can do around. Um, slowly add disinfectant and wait 20 minutes. When you do that, please put it like a paper towel over it and then spray over the paper towel that reduces your likelihood of generating aerosols when you're spraying um, uh, the disinfectant on the area. Uh, place recovered material and biohazard waste and then uh, place broken glass in a proof container. So use forceps, dustpan, don't use your hands uh, directly with the glass. Next one, please. And so if you have a exposure, exposure in your eyes, uh, use the eye wash station for 20 minutes. Uh, so that means holding your eyes open, putting them over the, over the water. Uh, splash skin, same thing, remove contaminated clothing and flush with water for 20 minutes. Yes, you will, if you have to get completely naked, that's one of the things you have to deal with, you know. Um, needle stick or cut with a sharp, wash the wound gently with soap and water. Also, if it, if you were working with a needle stick that's contaminated with something, always let us let OHP know. And the inhalation of aerosol, move away from the hazard, blow your nose. Uh, let EHS know of any spills or exposures, just so we keep track. And some of those, the state does need to know about those. Next, please. Um, so remember to register your viral vector research with the IBC. That's very important, please. Uh, safe work practices and controls, um, a clear understanding of the hazards associated with the vectors that you're working with, report any spills or exposures, and then contact your biosafety officer if you have any questions, even if they don't have the answer that will help you um, find, find the answer to your question. And I think that's it. Diana, can I ask a couple of questions? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's not very nice to your community representative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I might have I might have missed this, but could you detail the uh, routes of transmission for lentiviral vectors? I know you talked a little bit about respiratory protection, like right. the N95. Right. I was just curious: is, is it often that you tell your organization that they need to wear respiratory protection, um, and is that a risk with lentiviral vectors? Um, I mean, not all the time, because honestly, if you're working under a biosafety cabinet, the biosafety cabinet provides that protection for you. Um, but you can also get, you know, of course, like you can get a, a needle in you, um, you can get an animal biting you, uh, and things like that. But um, depending on what you're working with and where you're working with, that's you know you have to take that into consideration. Um, I know we had a PI that the piece of equipment he was working with was too big, so it did not fit into the biosafety cabinet. And so then they had an SOP that was special for that, so they had to use respiratory protection because now you're you have you don't have that barrier. So it just depends what you're working 
with and what the risks are from for what you're working with. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else uh, on the committee have any questions? Um, I guess my question was just around uh, the lab acquired infected infections. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know if there was if they were more common with certain uh, vectors than others. Uh, they are, um, but as a, it, I mean, it, it kind of also depends what you're working with. I know one lab was working with two viral vectors, and then they were working with a different organism. I don't remember off the top of my head, and then that recomb <laughs> recombined. But it wasn't even that the person was working with the same thing that caused the recombination. It was just two different researchers and that caused it. So um, it's not very often that it happens, but it does happen. I mean, it can happen, especially when you go to, high, the, to the higher risk level. So, of course, you know, that's that opens your possibility of getting because, of course, your risk is greater. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. I would say uh, that it's less likely that you're going to uh, have a lab acquired infection where it's exposure to uh, replication competent virus and more yes. that you've exposed yourself to the lentivirus and there might be unintended downstream effects because there's transgene. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's always a little bit dicey if you are messing with your genome. So. <laughs> But it's so fun. <laughs> does uh, I know does, we don't want your fingers to glow in the dark. Don't <laughs> inoculate with the, uh, the GSP vector. Does uh, everyone working with the viral vectors have to go through this training uh, that we just sat through, or is like the general biosafety sufficient? Um, so, I mean, you do the, your lab specific training, so you can, do, you do your general, of course, you know, you're working with blood or pathogens, but you should have the specific training if you're working with antiviral vectors, because there are extra hazards that come with that, that would not be covered under the general, um, blood or pathogen training. Cool. Okay. Um, any other questions before we move on to the, uh, the protocol review. Okay, so I think our next step is to discuss our new protocol today. We do have a new registration. Last year we just had an amendment. Um, and I think that we do have uh, somebody here today who can discuss this in more detail. Um, Marissa, you are a co-investigator on this, which thank you for letting us know that earlier, because that means that you do have a conflict of interest with this one. Um, we would love to get your input on the protocol, but when we actually vote, uh, we're going to have you step away and somebody will let you know when the vote has concluded. So you can come back in, but before then, it's a good opportunity to have you here so we can actually get the insider's uh, view of how this protocol is going to work. Marissa, would you like to give us a, uh, a layman summary of what's going on with this one? Sure, I can do that. Um, so this lab works on histone deacetylase. It's also called HDAC6. Um, this is a gene that ends up being highly expressed in lung cancer and um, really trying to understand if it could be a therapeutic target uh, for lung cancer. So there is a mouse model of lung cancer that's being used in this study. And um, what's going to be done is that a lentiviral vector is used to deliver a CRISPR-Cas9 system. So this system can silence or knock down gene expression. This uh, lentivirus is gonna deliver that system into this mouse lung cancer model in order to silence the HDAC6 expression in these animals. And then uh, lung tissue will be harvested and assessed for, um, for cancerous outcome. That's, that's a general gist. Okay, so 
you're using uh, lentivirus to uh, deliver the, the CRISPR to knock down the genes. Um, is this a third generation vector? That's right. It's a third generation vector, carries Cas9, carries a guide RNA that will target HDAC6. Mm -hmm. I can go through more details of the vector that's helpful to the committee. Um, sure. I think that especially after the training, it'd be good to hear a little bit more about the vector. Sure. Um, so this vector, um, like we said, it's third generation and um, it's self-inactivating uh, and it's going to be pseudotyped uh, with VSV. So it should be able to infect it. Just about any cell it comes across. Okay, and are you packaging the the virus in the lab, or are you getting pre-made vectors? That's right. It's being made in the laboratory. So we we receive the plasmids, and then we package it in a, a HEC two nine three cell. Yeah. Okay, and um, obviously you're uh, injecting this into mice, so you will be using sharps on the protocol. Um, are you using any safety sharps for this or are they all standard sharps? Safety sharps will be used for the injection into the mice, but we will be using scalpels to uh, get tissue in the end. So, Are you able to use disposable scalpels for this or are you going to be changing blades? Disposable. Okay, it's always helpful. Um, so I know you reviewed this, uh, Diana. Did you have any input or other uh, comments on the, you know, on the risk assessment part of this? Sorry. Um, the only thing, um, I guess if you can go back. Another, I think where the part where you do the, you say which that is a third generation antiviral. Oh, here, here. Uh, so uh, did I understand that it's gonna be VSB pseudotyped? Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, that part was missed in terms of filling out. Right, yeah, if we could just click on that, then that will take care of that. Okay, well, we'll make a note of that, that uh, that needs to be uh, corrected. Um, and does anybody else on the committee have questions about this one? Yeah, uh, yeah. Diana talked about, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Naomi. I was just gonna say, Diana talked about shedding um, and viruses. Did we take into consideration um, you know, when we're dosing the mice if there could be any shedding of the viral vector? I feel like I remember it in this protocol, but do not recall. Is that a risk, would you guys say? Diana, did you want to tackle that from the biosafety side or do you want me to? Um, I mean, I don't really think there's a high, there's a high uh, incidence of shedding. Um, especially, you know, your you have your animals under BSL BSL2, correct? Right. So Oh, you can go ahead, um, Marissa. Um, so this vector um, would not be known to replicate, be able to replicate mm -hmm. in the mouse. Um, so the, the risk is really at that point of administration of the vector gotcha. to the animal. So that's why we're proposing uh, BL2 for 72 hours after we inoculate mm -hmm. the animal. That, that will give enough time for the vector to enter cells, deliver their genetic payload, but then for the viral particles to be basically gone at that point. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. That sounds that sounds uh, right. That's typically what the committee has approved for um, third generation vectors. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Are the animals going to be restrained at all when we're using the safer sharps? Uh, out of grass or anesthetized or anything? Good question. Um, 
yes, we will anesthetize the animals for administration um, of the vector. How many people will be working on this um, protocol? And are they trained? So there's a team, I don't think it's, are the people listed on the protocol? Hmm. I don't think they're listed. I don't, I don't see any. Okay. And I don't see their training record as well. Yeah. So there's uh, about seven people working on this in this lab. Um, they've gone through the training that uh, Diana mentioned earlier, the general lab training. Those records can be provided to the committee. We'd like them. Okay. How many animals will be used for this research? How many animals? Um, I would say on the order of 50. Marissa, oh, I'm sorry, Naomi, you keep going, please. So I noticed that there was a place you mentioned that you use regular PP when um, handling these animals in the animal facilities. So does that include um, PP that could restrain for um, scratches and bites when handling as well? So the so it's a reference to the standard BL2 PPE for, for this animal facility. Um, so it would include gloves uh, and, and uh, a long sleeved gown um, would not necessarily be bite resistant. Uh, that's not standard. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Eddie, did you have another question? I did, but I lost it. <laughs> I'll, okay. come, I'll come back and think. I'm about sorry. How about Patrick? You've been very quiet this evening. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. So I guess my first was, um, do we, in terms of the target, do we, are we going to be monitoring for kind of uh, an exposure? from the lentiviral vector to researchers if there's an accident? Is there a, like, do we have expectations around what the outcome would be there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, a couple things. One is to consider uh, what our intended target is, which is HDAC6, um, and what the biological outcome would be if that was silenced in a researcher. And also thinking about the tissue where you might have an exposure. I mean, I'd say probably most um, uh, most common e exposure in a, an experiment like this is gonna be the needle stick. So probably into the fingers um, and some of the tissue in the fingers. Um, you know, maybe a splash to the eye, but that's probably much less frequently gonna be an issue. And then the other thing to consider is what off-target effects might be from Cas9 being expressed. Um, there is some potential for that. Um, so those are the two sort of biological functions to consider. Very good. Um, and then I guess I, as a community one member, just want to kind of wanted to um, recognize that we, sh we would want to have kind of a, a control program, pest control program for the um, uh, animal facility and, and wherever the animals are used. So. Oh, I, I do know that we already have a, uh, a program in place. Um, as the chair of the IBC, I just had to submit a uh, report to the city of Cambridge not that long ago, and that that is part of the report that we submitted, so. Very good. Um, and then I guess replication, uh, do we test the lentiviral uh, on some frequency? I mean, like annually or quarterly or when generated? The vector. Are you doing any replication competency testing uh, in the lab? That was not proposed yet, no. It is okay. third generation so for, for a plasmid system. Okay. Thank okay. you for that. Does anybody have any additional questions for Marissa? Because if not, we're going to have her 
step out. We can continue to do some discussing, but since she's involved in this protocol, she can't vote on it. <laughs> I remembered my question, believe it or not. Sorry, Marissa, <laughs> to drag you back in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about using uh, anesthesia before. I was just curious, and this isn't really a biosafety question, but do we have any setup to contain the anesthetic that we're using if we're using uh, any gas, like scavenging equipment or anything? On the other IVC, I said on they, they take that very seriously. Yes, our animal facility is well uh, outfitted for scavenging of waste anesthetic gas. Excellent. Great to know. Thank you. Just one last question. So, oh. <laughs> are there ways these animals are screened for diseases when you purchase them? The um, so the the facility will um will procure them from a vendor that already you know they have a known pathogen profile, so they're already screened for, to, to not have certain uh, certain pathogens. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so has Marissa stepped out? It looks like she has. Um, so this, correct me if I'm wrong, Diana, but this one does seem like a fairly straightforward biosafety level two based on the risk assessment and what she's planning on doing as far as um, what she already has planned. She right. already has the... Uh, the standard PPE. Um, mm -hmm. I think one thing that we need to do after this is follow up on uh, getting a current lab roster and making sure that everybody's yes. been trained. Um, mm -hmm. If you can follow up on that and just email the committee afterwards, I think that should be fine. Okay. Um, does anybody have any discussion or follow up questions that we, you know, does anybody have any issues with approving this at biosafety level two or any additional um, precautions that they would like to add on top of the, the standard precautions that are taken at biosafety level two? Um, nope. Just one thing, I noticed that they mentioned about transportation of the tissue to the lab itself. So I would want to uh, like a good description of how those um, tissues will be that, like transported to the lab i know they said they were going to be using like a hat container but the container should like bear like a biohazard symbol and you know just like a full documentation on how it will be transported to the main lab itself we can have them add that to the sop yeah. just as part okay. of it and maybe that that'll be because then they will have the good description for that and then that everybody should be following what they what they write on that I never got an SOP. <gasps> <laughs> what? <laughs> let's, in SOPs the interest are beautiful. Of, uh, in the interest of time, let's uh, propose somebody can make a motion to approve this at biosafety level two with the stipulations that we are going to ask them to provide their transport SOP for the tissue. Um, follow up on making sure we have a current lab roster with everyone trained mm -hmm. and correct the checkbox on the form that needs to be checked for the VSVG pseudotyping. Uh, were those all of the stipulations that we needed to approve? Yeah. And does everybody agree that this can, these, uh, can be done administratively and over email and we don't need to have a follow-up meeting to discuss um, assuming that there's no issues and that everybody's trained, that we don't sure. need a follow-up meeting to discuss the uh, changes. I'll be fine with that. Um, motion to approve? Yeah. Second? Second. All in favor of approving this at biosafety level two uh, with the aforementioned uh, stipulations. All right, we have a unanimous vote for approval. Um, okay, we can let uh, Marissa back in now. So if somebody wants to text her, hey, Marissa, you can you can let uh, the PI know that the protocol was approved. So <laughs> with stipulations, uh, we'll discuss after the meeting. 
Um, all right, so that was our only protocol on this agenda. Um, does anybody have any other topics that they would like to discuss? Taking another vacation. So. <laughs> you should definitely take another vacation, Eddie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Marissa, maybe we could have a tour of the lab uh, sometime in the next week if people are available just to get a look at uh, the setup. Certainly. Okay, that would be great. Um, does anybody have any additional questions or things that they would like to discuss? A couple of questions in the um, uh, Q&A. So um, yeah, maybe yeah, I'll, I'll kind of read a couple of them. So one is uh, are double gloves recommended for viral work? And then um, second would be how often should an IBC meet? Um, uh, and maybe someone can field those. Oh, I, I think that we're going to do that in a second, but we need to adjourn our meeting first. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there are no other topics of discussion within the committee, uh, we will adjourn our meeting. And unless we have new work that comes up uh, in the next couple of months, we'll plan to have another meeting next year, um, probably around the same time. If we need to meet sooner, I will let the committee know and we'll find a date. Great. Uh, all right, all in favor of adjourning the meeting. Okay, and now we can move on to the q and I saw that we got some questions. Yes, we did. And um, uh, we, we had, we had uh, Patrick on the pre-wrangling as well. He was chomping at the bit. <laughs> These questions are so good that came in. Um, so, and, and I learned a lot in the, in the panel too. This was, this was an awesome um, mock I, um, IBC here. So the first question came up during uh, the, the mock IBC before the protocol uh, presentation. The first question is, how is an accidental accidental recombination detected? Oh, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, sometimes you, you just find out by, you know, what's, what's growing, you know, like sometimes when you're testing in your tissues, you have something growing that's not supposed to. I know that's one. Sometimes then just people just get sick. <laughs> that's another one. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not something that happens that often at all. Well, I can chime in a little bit, which is I think you you probably saw the IBC discuss a little bit about what generation of vector was going to be used and whether testing was necessary. So there are tests that can be done during the process by which folks are packaging and creating these vectors to test for that replication competency that would happen if recombination occurred. So testing is oftentimes put into place mandatorily perhaps by an IBC when you're using those early generation vector systems that have a higher chance of uh, recombining. Honestly, for some of the, the newer versions, the chances of recombination have become so, so low that, um, that testing for replication competency is actually not necessary uh, anymore. So, but there are, there are assays to do it, um, not being used quite as frequently. We have safer systems. Okay, thank you both for the, the thoughtful answers there. Um, a why question as far as the science here, why was a mouse specific lentivirus not used? Very good question. I had the same thought when I was reading this proposed pro uh, protocol. Um, why not um, pseudotype it with a mouse specific uh, ligand? Yeah, I mean, very, very well could have been done, I think. Uh, it's perhaps, yeah, I mean, unless someone else thinks of a reason why it couldn't be done, I, you know, it, it might have been something that, that the committee could have could have asked about. So. And those questions do get asked sometimes. Uh, sometimes it has to do with what the scientist is uh, looking for and what model they're using. Uh, keep in mind that I'm not an, you know, a 
virologist or a oncologist or anything like that, but I know a lot of times they're using mice that are expressing, um, you know, humanized mice that are expressing human genes or human tissues or something like that. So to make it closer to how the materials would act in an actual human. So in those cases, you want your viral vector to infect human cells so that the model works correctly. Um, in other cases, especially earlier on in, um, you know, preclinical research where you're not really, you know, you're just looking at proof of concept basically early on, um, you definitely can use those safer vectors that can't infect humans. And it's always a good question to ask. So that was a very good question to ask. And if you're a community member on an IBC, you should definitely ask those types of questions. Absolutely. Um, so when it comes to viral work, are double gloves recommended? Um, that is a I controversial mean, topic. It right, depends, right. Yeah. It, de it depends. That's that's the that's the answer of it. You know, it it just depends what you're working with, and it also depends on. Because the thing is that you can also introduce risk by doing double gloving, right? Um, because now you're thinking, oh, I'm pr double protected, you know, but you're really just, it's just causing you to be more clumsy with work and things like that. So, I mean, it just depends what you're working with. So. Absolutely. Thanks, Diana. Um, and when it comes to replication competency, can replication competency be proven by a P24 ELISA test? <laughs> we have a scientist in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> All the tough questions here. A lot of some stumpers tonight. I defer to my scientist co colleagues and coworkers to aid me in that determination <laughs> in the IBC. I haven't looked at the list of. Um, I'm going with what Eddie said. Acid, but <laughs> it rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, when you have a committee, uh, you know, an actual committee uh, that is doing this for an institution that's doing this type of research, that's why we have subject matter experts. So that's why we would have virologists on our IBC, or if you're working with. Um, you know, animals, you have somebody who knows about the animals. Um, unfortunately, I am not that person. So like Eddie, I would defer to my more knowledgeable colleagues. Um, we have PH, people with PhDs in virology who could answer those questions for us. All right. And I want to go to some of the things that we saw in in the protocol uh, portion, and then you know some some questions came up there. So one was at the tail end: um, Does the PI need to leave the room when voting? If the PI who is on the protocol um, is at the meeting, it is considered best practice for them not to be present for the discussion and vote. Um, they have a direct interest in getting that protocol approved and also the committee is largely made up of their colleagues mm -hmm. so in order to have an honest discussion of the protocol and in order to make sure there's no conflict of interest in the voting typically they would be asked to leave for that portion um, mm -hmm. are they specifically required to leave for the vote not necessarily although they wouldn't be allowed to vote mm -hmm. um, but it can impact people's willingness to vote honestly if the PI is there. Um, now, occasionally it will come up where somebody recuses themselves from a vote because there's a perceived conflict of interest, but it's more along the lines of, um, you know, my wife's on this protocol or, you know, my brother-in-law is on this protocol or some my department chairs on this protocol. So they wouldn't necessarily need to leave the room because they're not necessarily going to take it personally if you don't vote for their protocol. Mm -hmm. um, although there's always that option. But definitely if somebody who's directly on the protocol is there, it's considered good practice to have them leave. So people feel free to uh make any difficult uh, decisions that they need to make without the PI staring them down. Um, 
<laughs> and I would just add to that, just make sure that when you have a PI that's going to have a conflict, that you have enough people for quorum when the PI leaves. That is also a good point, yeah. um, which quorum, what counts as quorum is really depends a little bit on how big your um, committee is and on your institutional policies. A lot of them are just a simple majority uh, plus at least one community member. Mm -hmm. uh, Would we include a non-voting member as our quorum uh, number as well? Like an invitee, like a PI? Or are we just talking specifically voting members and uh, uh, specifically voting members? Yes. It's voting yeah. members. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So just if you have to clarify that, who, uh, you know, for example, sometimes you'll invite somebody from the animal facility if there's going to be a difficult animal protocol, but they're not a voting member. They're just there to provide in input. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't count towards quorum. Mm -mm. Yep. Great. And speaking of things, when things get difficult, <laughs> uh, what if no is voted uh, on the protocol? If we vote no, what is the best practice for communicating that message? So there are a couple of different ways that you can vote no on a protocol in most committees. Uh, it could be that you're tabling it because more information is needed and you're going to allow it to come back, in which case uh, generally the chair of the committee would notify the PI via writing of the result of the vote and what would be needed to correct the protocol um, in order to have it come back. Uh, if it's an absolute flat no, like say they wanted to do a biosafety level three project and we have no biosafety level three facility, then they will be told that you know this, this work cannot commence at this institution. And again, it would be via writing from the chair of the committee to the PI. Um, they always have the option to try to revise that protocol to make it acceptable to the committee. Uh, any sort of letter of that nature would have the reasons why it was declined. Um, but yeah, if it's a, if it's a flat out no, you know you can't do your biosafety level three work in your biosafety level two lab. Um, that would be communicated to the PI, possibly verbally after the meeting, but also in writing. Um, is along with the reasons why it was declined. Thank you, Jessica. That's that's uh, that's great. Um, I know we're up against it time wise. Uh, there were two really good questions. I wonder if we can just do lightning round really quickly on them and then and then close. Um, is an IBC required to validate protocol adherence? So, Diana, did you have a? Well, I mean. It helps just because if you have a committee that is gonna is gonna check on your work, it does help. It just keeps everybody in the same level. Um, I my previous work is an institution with NIH, so we had to have an IBC because it was NIH. Um, we got we received NIH funds, so if you do that, you have to have it. Um, but um, I mean, I think it's just good practice to have. To have an IBC because then you do have uh, it helps knowing what's going on in your in your you know uh, company or your institution um, and it also you know um, you're able to keep track of what everybody's doing so it, and it as far as um, checking on whether the lab is behaving compliantly typically uh, as what most IBCs do, and I don't know that it's necessarily a regulatory requirement, but it is um, best practice and common practice, is there's a renewal um, mm -hmm. process for these registrations that are approved. That includes um, ensuring that the labs have been inspected, and part of the lab inspection is making sure that they are following the biosafety containment procedures that are approved in their protocol so yeah uh -huh. and just to tack on super quick i would just say like the biosafety officer not a formal requirement but always a good idea to do your due do, do your due diligence excuse me uh, and actually walk through the labs with the pi uh, maybe do a follow-up check-in if it's especially hazardous work as well and even if it's not especially hazardous if 
For example, you have a new PI and this may be their first time leading a project. It's always a good idea to follow up with them and make sure that they've got everything set up correctly. Um, they understand the training requirements, et cetera. Yeah, uh, as, um, as, as what Eddie, I'm just following up on that with the biosafety officer is good because then the biosafety officer can talk to the PI and sometimes the PIs do not know that they're required to do certain things until they start talking with you about it. And so then you can like help them out and point them in the right direction. So that helps too. Great, many, many thanks to our uh, panel here. Great questions and great and thoughtful answers from, from our group here. And uh, Sam, I'll get it back to you to close. Thank you so much, Lee. That was a really smoothly uh, run session and we got just enough questions to get us to 8.05, 8.04. So mm -hmm. in the interest of not keeping anybody past the amount of time we had, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and I hope this was helpful. We promise to get these recordings up and available. We will send a note out to all individuals who registered for either session. And we'll also provide the slides and some other material that we weren't able to share, but have gathered over time. And Aaron and I are both here. You know how to find us. If you are either a community member looking for some questions to get answered about serving, if you are uh, from another town around here in Massachusetts and you're looking for some guidance, you can reach out and we'll do the best we can. But most of all, we hope that people who have participated are willing to serve as community representatives. That's what we need and more than anything else. And we will be sending out a note to ask if you would, in fact, be willing to serve in that role. So I think I'll leave it there and thank everybody for coming. And uh, until we see each other again, I guess, sayonara. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.